Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Doug Career, as you might guess from the uh, opening slide here. Uh, this is Beryl's Wage and Hour Back to Basics, part of our sort of monthly series of presentations. Um, glad you were able to join us today. Uh, if you haven't already, it'd be helpful if you would make sure you mute your, your uh, machine, although I think on our end, we have everyone muted as well. If you do have any questions during this program, uh, I'd ask that you just use the chat function and I will try to answer them the best I can sort of at the appropriate time uh, through the presentation. And if there's any I don't get to during the presentation, I'll try to take them on at the end of the presentation. Uh, also, we, you know, as I was preparing for this program, it, it, there was just so much I was like, I wanna talk about this, I wanna talk about this, I gotta make sure I mention this. And so there's a lot of material in here. And, and if there is uh, the, the risk that I leave you sort of scratching your head on a particular point or leaving you with uh, a some question that isn't answered, feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to, uh, to answer your questions sort of after the program's over as, as well. <clears throat> and with that, I think uh, what we'll do is uh, get started. I will mention though real quickly that the next monthly program would be on September 16th. Uh, I think we're still thinking about what that topic is going to be, but uh, look out for uh, uh, notices on that, and we'd love to have you join us uh, for, for that program as well. All right, so let's get started. First thing is just to talk a little bit about the nature of wage and hour claims, because uh, it's important, I think, that you realize um, how they can start to take on a life of their own and can be extremely frustrating as an employer. So I'm gonna use the example of a situation where you have a discharged employee who sues a company and he says, you know, I actually worked through my lunch every day. I didn't put down my time, so I didn't get paid, but I actually did the work. And so you owe me for all that time. And so then the question is, okay, well, as far as we know, the person was taking their lunch. This is news to us. We had no idea. Uh, what happens next? What's our, ex our exposure? I think you're all aware that Maine law requires that an employee who works six or more hours is entitled to a rest break. <clears throat> and also that state and federal law both require uh, uh, that non-exempt employees be paid for all hours worked. And so if someone's working during their meal break and they're not getting paid for it, uh, arguably that's problematic. So here's our problem. It may be that the plaintiff's lawyer says, okay, I'm entitled that, you know, these lunch breaks total up about a thousand dollars in damages. And you're thinking, well, there's no way that this person was, uh, not, was, was not taking their lunch break because we saw them taking their lunch break. So we feel like they're making this up and they're trying to get money to which they're not entitled. And we obviously find that very irritating, very frustrating. And what the, the problem with the dynamics of this type of lawsuit is that you've got uh, this claim and if, if they ultimately are able to show that there were just a few lunch periods that he worked through and for which he was not paid, then they would get some damages. And there's a lot of factual arguments, discovery, depositions, things like that. So the attorney's fees for the plaintiff's attorney, next thing you know, may go up to $10,000. Uh, and uh, even before we say get to trial, and so then what happens is you get a settlement demand where they say we want $1,000 for the unpaid wages. Because it's covered by main law, there's trouble damages uh, where so they want an additional $2,000 in sort of these penalty damages. And the attorney says, plus I want $10,000 in attorney's fees. And so then you're saying, well, wait a second, how is it we had this issue of $1,000 and now the demand is $13,000? And then they say, you know, look, if you don't pay us this amount of money, um, then we'll just keep litigating it and attorney's fees will go up. And so we may ultimately show that the actual damages is a hundred bucks as opposed to a thousand dollars, which means it's troubled to three hundred dollars. But now the attorney's fees are eighteen thousand dollars. And so <clears throat> point is that once you get into one of these cases, um, as I said, it takes on a life of its own. It starts to spin out of control. So it's really important that you do your homework up front to avoid these types of problems. And that's why it's really important, as I 
flagged here on this slide, that you have clear policies regarding the meal breaks and the fact that you need to take your break and you need to report if you're gonna miss a break so that <clears throat> you can point to the fact that this person was supposed to, to let you know when in fact they uh, 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 missed a meal break because they had to keep working. Um, also, you need to have a policy that makes it very clear that employees have to accurately record their time so that if this employee is making the claim, you can emphasize that um, uh, they were violating their responsibilities by not accurately recording their time. And then the other thing is that you need to have good uh, documentation. And one of the ideal things to have in a situation like this is examples of employees reporting that they're missing a meal period, reporting that they're missing the, um, the meal period uh, because they had to keep working and that you paid them for that time. <clears throat> so, and well, this is, will be a reoccurring theme as we go through this, uh, uh, oops, as we go through this uh, uh, program. Now, another what if. You have a situation where an employee is not exempt, they're entitled to receive it over time, obviously then. And then the employee knows you have a tight budget, but wants to get the work done. They're dedicated employees, so they work past five without putting down all of their time. Or the employee is uh, one who just doesn't like having a messy desk at the end of the day, wants to get everything squared away, know that overtime is not gonna get approved, and so we'll just stay late so that they can clean everything up. So when they come in the next day, everything's orderly and, and they're, they're good to go. And they don't mind it, you know, as far as they're concerned, um, you know, it's something they wanna do. They're not being asked to do it and uh, they don't have any problem. You know that they're still there after five and you don't say a word. So what we just need to emphasize is that an employer who allows an employee to work off the clock is just as guilty as an employer who tells an employee, I need you to work off the clock. Um, there's no ability for an employee to waive their rights under the law. There's no ability of an employee to waive their rights to receive overtime. <clears throat> there's no way for an employee to consent to an employer not complying with its obligations under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And so the, the actual verbiage is if you suffer or permit someone to work, you need to pay them for that time. And so <clears throat> what happens is that employee may be down the road is laid off or discharged, becomes disgruntled, and then says, I'm entitled to all this time where I worked off the clock. They knew I was working off the clock because they'd see I was there after five. And it becomes a, you know, a huge problem along the lines of uh, what I just described in the first case. And the supervisor's like, yeah, 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 I knew that they were there after five, but I, I told them they shouldn't, and I didn't want them to, but they just kept doing it, and effectively, we allowed it to happen, and so now we've got a problem. And so another reoccurring theme during this program is to really emphasize that uh, supervisors have to understand their first line of defense, and they need to do their job. And if they're allowing someone to stay after five to clean up their desk, they're not doing their job and they're putting you at, um, at serious risk. And it doesn't matter that the employee wants to do it. It doesn't matter that they're dedicated. It doesn't matter that the employee will be irritated when you tell them they have to leave at five and leave their desk messy. Child labor laws. I don't have time in this program to go through child labor laws, but it's an area that can be problematic. And so take the time to make sure you understand the law is uh, employers are finding it harder and harder to uh, find people to work. <clears throat> they may be looking more towards bringing in students uh, and you need to um, uh, you know, make sure the supervisors are trained and what are the rules with respect to having uh, 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 st uh, uh, students stay late. Um, sometimes uh, we talk about using color codes for name badges to remind supervisors that this is someone who shouldn't be here past a certain hour. This citation is a good guide that you should look at that has a nice outline of, uh, of the rules as it relates to uh, child labor laws. All right, so we talk about the basics of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Obviously, we have to talk about exemptions under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And there's two that I really wanna focus on. <clears throat> the ex the uh, executive exemption and the uh, administrative exemption. 
uh, because they're the two that tend to be most common and they also be, tend to be the ones where employers make the most mistakes. The first part though, is that someone in order to be considered exempt has to meet the salary basis test. Now, everyone thinks in terms of what is the minimum salary under federal law, which is $684 per week. As, as I think many of you know, that, that number went up <clears throat> um, uh, under, and not as much as one time was thought it was gonna go up, but um, was increased. But we also have to recognize that Maine has its own law. And the Maine's law is to be exempt, you have to be paid 3000 times the state minimum wage. And that translates to, uh, uh, with the current minimum wage to $700.97. So a lot of employers may say, oh, I'm gonna pay someone you know, $690 because that gets me above the minimum salary threshold under federal law. But uh, that would not suffice in the state of Maine. So you really need to remember that you have to comply with both federal law and state law and that state law often will have a higher minimum threshold than federal law. <clears throat> now, with respect to the salary basis, you need to recall that pay cannot vary based on the amount of work that's done. Uh, and the other, you know, number one, I guess I'm gonna say probably the number one guiding principle, if an exempt employee works any part of a day, they must receive their salary for that day. There's no exceptions. Now that gets really problematic in this day and age because most exempt employees have um, their work email on their, uh, their iPhones, which means that almost inevitably <clears throat> every day uh, that they are quote unquote taking off, they're checking and responding to some work emails, which means more often than not, you're gonna to have to pay them, uh, make sure that they're paid for those uh, those days, even though they quote unquote took the day off. Now, if you're an exempt employee um, and you work any part of the work week, you must receive your full salary for that work week. There are exceptions. And the first, and here I've let, lined them out, but the, the first one is you can have an exception for a full day. Again, they can't work any part of the day absence for personal time sick time pursuant to a bona fide policy or suspension for serious safety violations. Okay, so if someone voluntarily chooses, you don't tell them to, they choose to take a full day off and they don't have any earned benefit time, you could choose not to pay them for that day provided they don't do any work. Um, if they run out of sick time pursuant to a bona fide policy and they take the full day off, um, you don't have to pay them for that, that time. And likewise, if you sus they're suspended for a serious safety violation, um, <clears throat> then, um, uh, you know, and this gets to the second bullet, you know, it's gotta be a violation of a, risk, uh, a written and consistently applied policy regarding serious misconduct like sexual harassment. Um, also, if you suspend someone for a full work week, uh, for any reason, then then that's fine because they're not working any part of the work week. So you need to be very careful when you think in terms of um, situations where you're going to pay someone less than their full salary. And if you find yourself in a situation where you're going to do that, you need to really double check to make sure that's permissible. Now, having said that, <clears throat> um, uh, Going down to the sort of the bottom part of this, um, it's where it says a half day absence results in a reduction in earned benefit time. Is that a problem? And the answer is it's not. And so usually when someone takes a sick day or a personal day, they use earned benefit time. So they get their full salary for the week. And so therefore, if they you know, take a full vacation day and they, or a full sick day and they check their email, it's not a problem because they're going to at the end of the at the end of the week they're going to get their full salary uh, and they'll have one you know earned benefit day taken from their um, earned benefit time bank and that's perfectly permissible. Um, where you get into trouble is when they've used up all their earned benefit time. They're taking the day off and you're questioning whether or not you can 
make that offset on their salary. Um, all right, so we know also that deductions can't be made because you know the person is gets witness leave or jury duty leave or military leave. <clears throat> uh, they they need to still receive their full salary, but if they get supplemental pay, for example, from the court, you can offset that supplemental pay. Um, they're also, even though the general rule is that to be exempt, your pay has to stay the same, regardless of the amount you work, there is some recognition that if you wanna give someone a bonus because they went above and beyond in doing extra work, that's fine. Uh, so that if you decide to provide bonus um, to compensate someone or recognize their, their uh, extra work, you can do that without forfeiting their exempt status. Uh, also, it's not a problem if you pay someone um, for only part of a week when they start and uh, end their employment. If you make a mistake, there is some uh, ability to correct the problem without having it void their exempt status. And, but to do that, you need to have a policy in place that makes it clear that we are prohibiting improper pay deductions and that we have a grievance mechanism available to employees that they can let you know if they feel as though an improper deduction was, was made. <clears throat> and it's also important, obviously, that if you learn that a mistake's been made, that you correct it as, as quickly as possible. And so if you find that someone, you thought they took a full day off, but and they you made the deduction, but it turns out they did some work, and you pay them for the day after the fact, then their exempt status will stay in place. All right, understanding exempt classifications, true or false, paying an employee a salary makes the employee exempt. I think we all know the answer is that's false. Paying a salary is only one required factor. And so now we're gonna talk about the executive exemption and the um, administrative exemption. Let's start with the executive exemption. To qualify for the executive employee exemption, all, underlined all, of the following tests need to be met. And I know you've all seen this before, but <clears throat> you can see what I have bolded. And uh, those are the concepts that I wanna focus on um, for, this, for this discussion. It has to be compensated on a salary basis. The employee's primary duty must be managing the enterprise or a recognized department or subdivision of the enterprise uh, must direct the work of two or more full-time equivalent employees. And uh, they must have the authority to hire or fire employees or employee suggestions or recommendations are given particular weight, okay? And so what happens is a lot of times people focus on that, that third bullet and say, oh yeah, you supervise two people, so I think we're all set. And the thing is, though, that if all you're doing is sort of supervising two other employees, uh, it may very well be that your primary duty isn't, you know, supervising these employees and managing the department. And so you have to really focus on this, this concept of uh, primary duty. Um, and so it's got to fall in the category of one of two things in my view, either it typically means you spend more than 50% of your time doing it. That's pretty easy because it's the majority. So therefore it's the primary duty <clears throat> or it's the main and most important duty. It's sort of why the position exists. You know, so there may be a situation where you have an outpost where there's, you know, three people work and one person is in charge of the uh, sort of a working supervisor and is in charge of the outpost. And, um, but they spend more than half their time, you know, doing work work as opposed to managing work. But that position exists in that outpost because someone's got to be in charge of the whole place. And so there, I think there's a strong argument that even though it's less than 50% of the time, it's still the primary duty. Uh, but more often than not, what we try to do is look to the idea that someone is um, spending more than 50% of their time managing. All right, so what is managing? Now managing is, well, basically I've listed it out here, but it's sort of what you would envision. It, go, it goes beyond just though interacting with the employee and telling the employee, this is your assignment and making sure the employee got in in time and 
talking about any problems they may have and checking up on their work and completing their evaluation and dealing with um, you know, safety compliance. But it also can involve things like <clears throat> you know, making sure there's enough supplies and, and uh, making sure that um, you know, uh, customers are satisfied or, or uh, basically making sure the department is running smoothly and as goals are being accomplished, um, expectations are being met. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a lot there that can go into this concept of, of, of managing, which is, is helpful in order to uh, comply with, um, uh, uh, you know, the exemption requirements. So when you think of, for example, a, um, the person who's head of housekeeping who does a lot of housekeeping themselves, but they're spending a lot of time making sure that, you know, the other housekeepers are doing their job, have the equipment they need, checking in with uh, uh, you know, the residents, I'm thinking in sort of a nursing home facility uh, to make sure that you know, their needs are being met, things like that. That's, that's all in the category of, of, of uh, managing. But then keep in mind that they also have to have the ability, if we go back to the other slide, to uh, uh, basically hire and fire. And in federal law, we see this a lot in the National Relation, Labor Relations Act, you know, who's a supervisor? And they feel as though that, you know, they need to really be able to have an impact on hiring, firing, and compensation. Uh, it's not enough often that they just do evaluations. The question is, will the evaluations affect whether or not someone keeps their job? Will the evaluations affect how much they will get paid? because that's then really sets someone apart in the supervisory role. But there's a recognition that in, in reality, that most employers are like, I'm not just gonna let anyone make hiring and firing decisions. It's too important. You know, if you fire someone and violate a law, we could be in a two year battle that could cost us hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I'm not gonna trust that to the head of housekeeping. Um, and so uh, the law recognizes that it may be someone else making the decision, but is this person recommendation being given quote unquote particular weight? And so you need to think about that as to whether or not that's the case. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, are recommendations actually made? How often are those recommendations relied upon? So when we litigate this, we will look at situations where someone was hired. Did the head of housekeeping interview the person? Did the head of housekeeping want that person? Uh, did the head of housekeeping veto that uh, someone else, you know, that who didn't get hired? You know, I mean, ideally you have a situation where like, oh yeah, we interviewed uh, uh, employee or, you know, uh, candidate X, we'll call it uh, candidate Joe. And the head of housekeeping was like, I don't think Joe's going to be very good. I don't think Joe's going to have a very strong work ethic. And so we made the decision not to hire Joe. Uh, and, uh, or we hired Sally and, and, uh, that was because the head of housekeeping said, I interviewed four candidates and Sally's my favorite. I think we should hire Sally. And so we did it. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, that's the type of uh, proof that you're going to want to have to be able to demonstrate that this, <clears throat> that this is met. And you sort of have the same thing with respect to, uh, 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 to firing. Um, and it doesn't matter that, um, necessarily that their, their decision isn't necessarily adopted every time. So if, if the head of housekeeping comes in and says, Sally's not working out, I want to fire Sally, talk with HR, there's senior managers involved, and ultimately it's decided that we're going to give Sally a written warning and an opportunity to improve because that's, we think, the prudent thing to do. Um, but, you know, there was serious discussion about what to do about it, and, and the head of housekeeping was part of that then I think you've met this particular weight um, requirement, even though uh, the head of housekeeping's recommendation ultimately wasn't adopted. Administrative exemption. All right, this is sort of the catch-all that employers love to rely on to make people exempt. When they had to have someone who doesn't run a department, when they're not a professional employee, and so they're like, okay, we're all set. We're just going to have this person be exempt on the administrative employee exemption. And if you dig into the regulations, 
the regulations say, uh-uh, this is not to be a catch-all. This is to be narrowly construed. This is not to be liberally applied in a way that allows you to you know, have everyone, even if they're well compensated, to have them be uh, treated as um, an exempt employee. So you really, and, and most employers, when they get audited and there's a violation found in terms of an inappropriate classification, it's more often than not in this category. So let's make sure we dig down a little bit and understand how this really works. <clears throat> the employee's primary duty uh, must be uh, the performance of office or non-manual work directly related to the management or general business operations of the employer or the employer's customer, all right? So you have that primary duty concept again. And then you also have this idea, it's gotta be work directly related to management or general business operations. And with that, well, we'll talk about what that means. And then the next one is primary duty. Again, we have that same concept, includes the exercise of discretion and independent judgment with respect to matters of significance, okay? So primary duty we've talked about. We know that it's spend more than 50% of your time doing it or it's the reason why your position exists. Um, but what is then directly related to management or general business operations? I think what you need to think about is in terms of a business that makes widgets, if they're involved in making the widgets, then administrative exemption is not a, something that you should be looking at. Um, it's those who are involved in running, running or sort of servicing the business as opposed to producing the product. So there's some typical ones, the tax department, the finance department, accounting, marketing, human resources, legal compliance. I mean, I've got the whole list right there. You know, it's, it's sort of those administrative roles for which it would be a, um, applicable. All right, what's discretion and independent judgment? Uh, I've listed three bullets there. I don't need to read them for you, but the idea is that um, if, if it's fairly routine, uh, then uh, even though you know, it may seem complex, if it's fairly routine, then um, you know it's not going to cut it. So let's take an auditor position. If the auditor, who's well compensated, and it's important that they do their job because if it turns out that mistakes are being made and they're not caught in the audit, we could have issues of legal compliance. We could have issues of public relations concerns. We could have issues of customer dissatisfaction. Um, if they don't do their job right, it could be very problematic on all three of those fronts. Um, you still have to ask yourself, are they really using discretion and independent judgment? If they are given a checklist of saying, you know, these are the documents you need to look at. These are the questions you need to ask. These are the items that need to be addressed. If you discover a problem here, this is what you need to tell them to do in order to correct the problem. If it's basically a roadmap that's provided that spells out how you proceed, then you really don't have any discretion or independent judgment. It's actually pretty routine. But if you're an auditor and um, you, know, you have to decide because every circumstance is different, what questions to ask, you have to decide what documents to look at that is not just, you know, straightforward, you know, that you have to like say, all right, I don't know really what this client has in the way of, um, uh, or, or what this department has in the way of documentation or how they do things. And so I've got to figure out what questions it is I want to ask them so I can figure out what it is they're really doing. Um, and, uh, uh, and then I got to figure out what documents they may have and where to go look for those documents. And so I'm almost like an investigator here. Uh, and so I need to analyze all this information and then draw conclusions. And then it's not enough to just say, oh, this is a problem. I got to figure out how to solve that problem. And there's different alternatives as to how to solve that problem. 
And I got to compare these different alternatives and decide what's the best course of action, factoring in, you know, logistics, the practical ability to comply, the cost, the personnel, those types of things. So that I could come in and say, you know, in, in, in doing my examination, I've identified these issues and these are my recommended solutions that's exercising discretion and independent judgment. Uh, and so you really need to think about when you've classified someone as administrative exempt, are they you know, making decisions? Are they analyzing information? Are they drawing conclusions? Are they comparing alternative solutions and deciding the best cost of action? All right, so what is not discretion and independent judgment? It's right there. It's not following prescribed procedures. It's not simply reporting what the results are. Um, and um, it's also not a situation where someone else is just redoing, um, someone should not be redoing the employee's work. <clears throat> um, so uh, uh, now shifting to matters of significance. Let's say that uh, you would trust me to make a deposit of $10 million. If I don't do my job right, I think it's um, easy to say that that's a matter of significance. That's a lot of money. Um, but high financial implications by itself doesn't mean that the exemption applies, you know, because if I'm told, you know, this is how I go, this is a pre process, the procedure I have to follow to make that deposit then I'm not using discretion and independent judgment. Um, but it's also, you know, if, if you don't do your job well and there could be serious financial implications, <clears throat> that suggests that there's matters of significance. But even if there aren't serious financial implications, if it can involve issues of employee morale or public relations, that can uh, also involve matters of significance. So for example, someone in HR, may uh, be trying to decide what policy to recommend. And again, they don't necessarily have to be the ultimate decision authority, but they need to be able to make effective recommendations. To make a particular recommendation on a particular policy. Um, and they have to think about, all right, what are the alternatives? And what are the pros and cons of all these alternatives? And you know, what do I think will work within, and within this organization? What do I think is consistent with our culture? What is going to drive our goals? Um, and they're going to make that recommendation. And if they advise to adopt a policy that doesn't really make sense or that's going to have an adverse impact on morale, that's a matter of significance uh, because it can affect productivity. It can affect turnover. It can affect um, you know, whether or not people like coming to work. It can affect whether or not they tell people it's a great place to work and whether or not they apply all sorts of ramifications that can relate to whether or not HR does a good job in terms of you know, developing policies and guidance for how we all work together. I wanna to talk a little bit about the outside sales exemption because it's often not um, given much attention. Um, and uh, the tests are right there. It's again, the primary duty about making orders and contracts of services. And there's sort of this recognition that if you have an outside salesperson, it's really hard to figure out how much they're working uh, and, um, uh, and, and hard to keep track of. And so uh, they basically say, you know, we can have an exemption for that. And actually you don't even have to pay them on a salary uh, basis. You can also pay them on a commission basis. Um, but uh, you need to really be able to show that the person is customarily and regularly engaged away from the employer's place of business. And uh, they can have some time you know, in the office, they can be making some calls to customers and the like. But you, what happens is you see it's sort of morph where the person you know, tends to be in the office more than on the road. And you, so you gotta really pay attention to that. Then you also have the issue of drivers who deliver product, but also try to make sales while they're delivering product. And if you have someone in that position, it's worthwhile sort of checking with counsel to talk through that because what is really their primary duty? Is it delivering the product or is it making the sale? And that could be a real you know, factual determination. So my uh, 
the advice to all of you is take this as an opportunity uh, to you know, audit your workforce and confirm whether or not you think people have been properly classified. And I think that means looking also at the job descriptions to see if they support the classification. Do they reflect the fact that someone's primary duty is working on matters of um, uh, involving discretion and independent judgment matters of significance? What you're likely to find is that you're much more likely to uh, class of, have to reclassify someone as exempt to make them not exempt. That you got too aggressive in trying to treat the person as as exempt, and then that sort of begs the question: uh, uh, What do you do when you have someone who uh, is you think more properly classified as non exempt, but you've been treating them as exempt? And if you call up the Department of Labor, the Department of Labor is going to say, well, then you should go back uh, two years and um, pay them uh, whatever overtime they're entitled to for those two years if you misclassified them. Plaintiff's lawyer will say, well, actually, under Maine law, there's a six year statute of limitations, so you should go back six years and pay them overtime for the past six years. Most employers are like, uh, I'm not sure that. Uh, that makes sense to us. And so, um, you know, what do you do and how do you do it uh, in a way that it doesn't sort of raise a red flag? And, uh, uh, and sometimes the answer is that we take the position that we think they were properly classified as exempt, but we just decided going forward that we want them to be um, non-exempt. Sometimes we will um, tie it into um, a change in their job. Um, to say, you know, we're making some changes and there's a change in your position. And because we've changed your position, we're moving it from exempt to non-exempt. But you really, if you find yourself in the situation where you need to reclassify someone, you need to think about whether or not, you know, it's so egregious that you need to make up for uh, the failings to provide overtime in the past or what the messaging is going to be to not... Um, uh, create some scenario where it's argued that you knowingly chose to um, treat someone as uh, an exempt and, and not make them whole once you discovered that was an error. All right, so in our remaining 20 minutes, I want to talk about um, what I think are the 10 most common problem areas. Uh, the first is, as I just described, the uh, concept of um, exempt status. And, you know, we see this all the time on Department of Labor audits. Uh, it regularly comes up. Um, oftentimes, uh, employers want people to be treated as exempt, so they stretch it. A lot of times, employees want to be treated as exempt. They're offended. Um, if you tell them that they're not exempt uh, and that they view that as, um, you know, a demeaning um, characterization of their role to say that they're in a non-exempt role. And so it can be some, some <clears throat> awkward discussions with the employees and with uh, uh, department heads when you, when you examine this question of exempt status. But I think what we find is it is regularly part of Department of Labor audits uh, raised as issues and also uh, plaintiff claims. Someone is terminated and they're unhappy and their lawyer gets in there and adds to their multiple of claims that they were misclassified. And that can be particularly frustrating because when you think you might get summary judgment on everything else, there's often factual issues on exempt status, which means they'll survive summary judgment. And those claims often are not covered by insurance. Uh, and so, you know, again, this is an area, it's sort of like the, the lunch break thing I was describing. You want to really make sure you're proactive and have your act together because you don't want it to be part of a case later on. The second thing that we often see is the working off the clock. And the two most common examples are where uh, managers turn a blind eye because someone's staying later than they should or they're working through their lunch time. And the employer's like, I got a tight budget, so I can't afford overtime. Um, the employee doesn't seem to mind. 
and I'm not asking to do it, so I don't think it's a problem. But then ultimately when um, it comes to light, and more often than not, it comes to light one of two ways. Department of Labor comes in during their audit, they're gonna ask to interview employees, and they will ask them questions about whether or not you know, they ever work uh, and don't put down their time. And some employees may truthfully answer yes, and then the Department of Labor fixates on that and makes it an issue. The other is, of course, the disgruntled employee who's upset that they got fired. Maybe they go through the termination checklist with their plaintiff's lawyer who says, I don't see any claim for wrongful discharge, but I do think we can make a claim for the fact that you were working off the clock and not getting paid. And then the question is, you know, did we know or should we have known that they were working off the clock and oftentimes the answer is that at very least it'll be a factual issue that a jury will decide. But more often than not, it's hard to argue that we didn't because the supervisor was there at 515 and saw the employee was still working. I mean, it must have seen them still at their desk. Um, and uh, uh, maybe even the testimony is that at some point they said, oh, you know, you should go home. You shouldn't keep working. The person's like, oh, I just have some more things I want to finish up. And the supervisor's like, all right, well, you know, you should get home. And, and uh, but then you, you know, clearly knew they were working and didn't make a point of telling them to put it down as overtime. Or during lunchtime, they can see that they're working as opposed to having, you know, gone off and taken their, um, you know, lunch break. They're sitting at their desk or, or station, whatever the case may be. <clears throat> so um, you really got to read supervisors the riot act and and there are times when you have to discipline employees uh, to, um, uh, because they choose to continue to work off the clock. You know, the person who says, I'm really dedicated and, and this is important to me and I don't care that you don't pay me. You know, the first thing you do is you start with a discussion saying, we understand you're dedicated. We appreciate that. Um, what's your work ethics, one of the things we love about you, but you know, the law is the law. We can't waive the law. And so you just, you can't be working past five. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, and I've had, I've had situations where we actually terminated someone's employment for, for doing this as, as counterintuitive as that may sound, but it was just necessary because it really became a, a, a form of insubordination. Uh, and I got to tell you that if you had showed that you can, you wrote someone up for, um, staying beyond their five o'clock, um, and you could show that to the Department of Labor, that's going to help very much with the audit because they're going to know that you've been self-policing. But also remember that if you show that you wrote someone up for working off the clock, you need to also be able to show that you went and paid them even though you didn't want them to work off the clock. So that if you have a warning that says, you know, on this day you worked an extra hour without permission, you shouldn't do that. You need to show that you paid them for that hour. So be mindful of that. The third is meal breaks. And, uh, you know, what you find is that employees say that even though they were entitled to that half hour off under Maine state law, that they didn't get to take the time. And sometimes they say they got paid for it. Sometimes they say they didn't get paid for it. And if they didn't get paid for it, then that becomes a Fair Labor Standards Act issue too. But even if they got paid for it, they can claim you violated the law by not allowing them to take the breaks. And you know, if you find that someone's making that claim, like let's say you give them some additional duties and their response is, I can't believe you're doing that. I don't have time. I'm already really busy. I can't take my meal breaks. Um, you know, you got to follow up with that. And you got to show that, you know, you got to make a point that tell them that they're taking the breaks. Now, keep in mind, unlike most wage and hour laws, which can't be waived, this is one where you can enter into an agreement with the employee so that they can agree that they will, you know, skip their meal break and get paid for it, or they'll skip their meal break and leave a half hour early. Um, that should be in writing. Um, but, and if you're going to do it in writing, make it clear in writing that both you and the employee have the right to reverse that decision. Uh, but uh, long and short of it is, um, you know, this is an area where I see a lot of problems. And, you know, you want to make sure, as I said, that there's a clear policy that you take your break. And if for some reason you can't take your break, you let your supervisor know and that it's documented that 
um, the person was paid for it and that um, steps are taken to make sure they can take their break in the future. Supervisors get lazy on that, say, oh, I told them they should take their breaks and, but they, you know, and then they didn't. And that, that doesn't present much of a defense. In fact, it makes things worse because it shows we knew they weren't taking their breaks, but they weren't being given the chance to do so or they weren't being paid for it. The fourth is uh, child labor violations. Won't go into that. I've talked about that already. So I'm going to skip down to the fifth. The fifth is unclear commission and bonus payment terms. And what I mean by that is it's not an even playing field in the state of Maine. We have a, a, a number of, of provisions that basically say you have to pay employees what they're owed. And if you don't, even if the mistake was a good faith mistake, you owe trouble damages. So I've had situations where someone's like, I earned a $250,000 bonus and the employer's like, no, you didn't. And then they're bringing a claim for $750,000. And they are saying that um, also they get attorney's fees and interest under the statute. And the problem is that the bonus arrangement was vague. And so there's room to argue over whether or not they were entitled to this bonus. And so if you win, what that means is you pay me a ton of money and don't pay the bonus. Uh, and if you lose, that means you pay me a ton of money to defend you. You pay all the attorney's fees of the plaintiff's lawyer, and then you pay the amount of the bonus plus um, penalty damages and amount equal to twice the amount of the bonus. So because you didn't do a good job writing your commission or bonus plan, what should have been a no brainer, we don't owe you the bonus, is now a million dollar claim. Um, and okay, so maybe it's a commission plan and so the amount at issue is only $50,000. If we had a clear commission plan, which would, should have been a no brainer, there's no commission due, is now a $400,000 claim. So I cannot emphasize enough uh, how important it is that if you're going to have a bonus arrangement or a commission arrangement, that you read that and poke and prod at it to figure out is there any vagueness or uncertainty as to how it works, especially tied around when it's earned, when it's going to be paid out, and what happens upon termination of employment. So uh, that, that advice alone can, I think, save you a lot of um, uh, aggravation and, uh, and problems. Next thing, misunderstanding comp time. Uh, probably most of you are well aware that comp time is really a confusing concept for most supervisors. A lot of people are like, oh, you know what? I'm, you worked an extra 10 hours this week, so I'm gonna give you 10 hours a day off the next week, and I don't owe any overtime. And more often than not, they're thinking we pay bi-weekly, so in the end, you just worked 80 hours. It was 50 hours one week, 30 hours the next week. We're all set. I gave you comp time. Or they give you a comp time bank, you know, and says you work 50 hours. You got 10 hours you can take, two hours off here, two hours off there as time goes by. None of that works because the law is that you have to pay someone overtime. If they work more than 40 hours in a work week. And so that means they get time and a half for those extra 10 hours in week one. <clears throat> It doesn't mean uh, that you can just give them 10 hours off the next week. And so if you have any comp time arrangements, or if you think there's any supervisors who are adopting comp time arrangements on an informal basis, you need to get, get on top of that. All right, number seven is uh, not factoring bonus payments into the calculation of hours work. Uh, and the regular rate of pay. I say hours worked, I really should say uh, regular rate. Um, and the idea is this, that um, you, know, you think that someone is paid $25 an hour and that's their regular rate. But then they get a quarterly bonus, a production bonus or whatever that let's say uh, during that quarter, they work 500 um, hours and that the bonus amount was $500. Under the law, you have to factor that bonus because it's not a discretionary bonus. You have to factor that bonus into the regular rate calculation. Uh, and so uh, what that means is that 
the $500 bonus, uh, which is spread out over that quarter during which they work 500 hours, is as though they received an extra dollar an hour. $500 divided by 500 hours is one. And so um, what that means is that if they had 20 hours of overtime, um, the regular rate wasn't $25 an hour, it was $26 an hour, but you paid the overtime based on 25, which means you owe them the overtime portion of the bonus amount, which would be the equivalent of taking the um, you know, $1 times the 20 hours times the halftime portion, since we've already paid the straight time portion through the bonus, so we owe them an extra 10 bucks. Um, and a lot of employers miss that. Now, discretionary bonus, it has to be both with respect to um, whether it's gonna be paid and how it's gonna be calculated. So if you say to someone, I'm gonna give you a bonus based on your productivity. This is an incentive for you. I'm not sure exactly how I'm gonna calculate it, but you know, if you produce, do good work, uh, I'm gonna give you a bonus then it's not discretionary, even though you've reserved your right to the idea of how I'm gonna determine what it's gonna be. Um, and if you say to someone up front, you have the ability to earn a bonus of you know, $500 a quarter, and, um, but you're not clear on how, what they need to do in order to do that. And you say, you know, so we have discretion looking at performance as to how it's gonna happen. That's still not discretionary because you're really telling them up front and using it as an incentive to get them to do better work, to show up to work, that type of thing. It's really to be discretionary, you need to be thinking in terms of you show up after the fact and say, you know, you did a brilliant job. And so I'm going to give you this, this 500 bucks and um, there's a bonus and they didn't know it was coming. <clears throat> that would be discretionary. You wouldn't have to factor it into the regular rate calculation. Uh, number eight. Uh, on-call payments. I don't know how many of you have employees who work on call uh, and sometimes that they will get, you know, a hundred dollars to be on call, whether or not they're called in. Well, you need to be thinking in terms of factoring that into the regular way calculation, um, uh, just as I described the bonus payment, because it's really effectively a bonus payment. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, that's hundred dollars impacts the regular rate for the week that they're on call and you need to be mindful of, of that. Um, but a lot of times also what will happen is that employers will say to, to employees who are on call, um, we're going to pay you this amount of money for being on call. And to the extent you get overtime hours because of that. Um, it goes to satisfy the overtime premium that results because of those on-call overtime hours. Depending on how you structure that, and I'm sorry, it's too complex to get into and in, right here, but depending on how you structure that, you may not be able to use those on-call payments to satisfy your overtime liability. And so if you are having an on-call structure where you are saying this on-call payment covers up, co uh, you know, covers the um, uh, overtime premium, you need to review that with counsel because um, that, that may not work. <clears throat> All right, number nine, uh, not making payments in a timely manner. Maine law has requirements that you pay employees in a timely manner. And um, that relates both to during employment and after employment. And so uh, employers are supposed to uh, pay wages within eight days of when they're due. And for non-exempt employees, you can um, choose to pay them weekly or bi-weekly or bi-monthly. But then whatever you know, it is, you have to pay them within eight days. And so if you pay them late, then there are damages that are owed. Plaintiff's lawyers are arguing that uh, if you pay someone on the ninth day, let's say they're owed $1,000 and you pay them on the ninth day, 
that even though you've already paid them, you still owe them double damages on top of that. So that if you paid 100 employees a day late, each 1,000, that um, and you've paid them in full and they only got it a day late, that they're owed an additional $200,000. Uh, so there's heavily, heavy, heavy, heavy penalties that go with that, say plaintiff's lawyers. <clears throat> it's not clear to me, I think there's arguments to the contrary on that. And I think it's a little bit unresolved. Um, and there's, but there is some, um, uh, there is some uh, uh, court precedent out there that really, you know, raises a, a question as to whether or not that may be a viable argument. Um, and so best not to test it. Make sure you pay people in a timely manner. Same with, let's say you owe someone vacation pay upon termination of employment and you pay it late. Um, they can argue you owe the double damages, even though they just, they got fully paid and, and um, the payment was just a few days late. So don't mess with that. Um, the final one is uh, misclassification of independent contractors. And I know this is a topic that all of you are familiar with. I think everyone's aware that serious efforts are being made to uh, make sure that independent contractors are truly independent and that if there's any question, they're treated as employees and get the benefit of employment status. This is my short test that I think you can use to at least tell you whether or not you think there's a problem. Um, and know that the benefit of the doubt is gonna be going towards treating someone as an employee as opposed to an independent contractor. Uh, and that um, uh, more and more, you know, the agencies are being aggressive and saying that that everyone, um, unless they're clearly fall in the category of independent contractor needs to be treated as employee. So my short test is this, you know, does the worker perform services of the essence of the business? If it's a bank teller, the answer is yes. If it's a painter who's coming in to paint at the bank, the answer is no, because the bank, the essence of their business isn't painting. Does the business have the right to direct and control the individual? doesn't even really focus on whether or not they actually do it, it's whether or not they have the right to do it. With the teller, they have the right to say, yes, you need to stand here, these are the forms you need to use, this is what we want you to say to um, the customer, this is how we want you to process the deposits, this is how the proof documentation we want before we start handing out money. Um, the painter, they're like, see this wall, it's white, I want it to be brown. I don't know what paint you use. I don't know how you go about it. I don't know what, you know, what brushes you use. Can you just make this brown, this wall turn from white to brown? And so they really don't have the, the ability to direct and control. <clears throat> and then are the worker services not really available to the general public? For the teller, they're your teller. It's not like they're out there with, you know, um, Jane Doe teller services, you know, and advertising with their own um, invoicing structure and, and advertising and marketing and the like, and you know, their own website and whatnot. Whereas the painting company holds themselves out as being available to paint. They have their own website. They have their own truck with their label. They have their own equipment. They, they market and advertise. They do promotions, whatever the case may be. So the bottom line is if the answer to any of these short test questions is yes, then you need to just be aware that um, there's a red flag. And there's probably a strong argument, if the answer to any one of these questions is yes, that the person is not properly an independent contract. Doesn't really decide the issue, it just means that you really need to dig in and, and look to see whether or not um, uh, <clears throat> you've got the person misclassified as an independent contractor. So critical points to remember, sort of the takeaways, um, exempt positions, look at the job descriptions, make sure the classification is appropriate, the compensation, commission, bonus plans, make sure it's very clear how they work, um, maintain records to, about your efforts to comply with the wage and hour laws. For example, you know, make a note of a situation where you see someone working off the clock and you you send them a note telling them not to do that and you can show that you paid them for that time. Make records of showing that you have uh, advised people that um, they need to uh, take their lunches or let management know if they're not taking it, that um, 
you uh, can show that you paid someone and that their timesheet reflects if they work through a lunch, you know, that type of thing. And then finally, um, supervisors of the front line, you need to train them so that they understand their responsibility in enforcing these rules, like making sure that people are taking their lunches, making sure that they're um, writing down their time accurately, making sure that they are not working um, after they're supposed to have stopped working. And I think you need to audit their performance. <clears throat> I think you need to check to determine whether or not they're doing their job. And, um, uh, and you know, you need to decide the sort of the best way to do that, but to ask them questions about, you know, do you ever find that you have someone working beyond five or, you know, maybe walk the halls. And if you see someone who's there beyond five, you know, don't circle back to see whether or not they put in time for overtime. And if not, then ask why not, what the supervisor knew about it, why the supervisor wasn't on top of that. Uh, so uh, uh, those are the four, what I would say, takeaway critical points to remember. <clears throat> and that's it. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. I, I think we brought it in, brought it home within the hour. Uh, if based on any of this, uh, you have any questions, um, feel free to follow up with me. Um, uh, you have my email right there. I'm happy to, or, you know, you can call and I'm happy to uh, circle back and, um, uh, you know, clarify anything that I might've shared with you today. And so that then ends our, our program. And again, thank you for attending and, and join us again on September 16th. You'll get a notice uh, topic to be announced. Um, take care, everyone be well. Thank you.